Welcome back to Free Media. I'm Robbie Suave here with Ryan Grimm, reporter for Dropsite News. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me here. So Donald Trump has selected Senator J.D. Vance to be his running mate. Reacting to the news, CNN's Van Jones, former Maoist, Robbie, <laughs> said that he was horrified by Vance and lamented that NATO is in deep trouble, which is a strange thing for a Maoist to be concerned about. Jones also said he wished Trump had picked Nikki Haley Instead, again, a strange thing for a mouse to say. Let's watch. You know, part of the reason that J.D. Vance matters um, isn't for these kind of short-term electoral calculations. He matters because of what he means to the Republican Party long-term. This is cementing a kind of nationalism. Yeah. Now, Trump, to your point, I agree with you, he, he's an instinctive, impulsive, intuitive nationalist. J.D. Vance is an ideological nationalist. That's a much more dangerous virus because he can make this, he can polish this stuff and make it seem palatable to people. He can sell this stuff to Silicon Valley. He can sell this stuff other places. And what it does is it locks the Republican Party on a pathway uh, that I think is dangerous for the world. Again, the Ukrainians are now in deep trouble. Um, NATO is now in deep trouble. So on one level, maybe he's correct that Vance is more ideological than Trump. That certainly seems plausible, although... J.D. Vance has also changed his mind a lot over the last just eight years. He originally, it's funny that you know people are saying, if you ever called Trump a Hitler, you're responsible for what happened to him in the political assassination. Well, J.D. Vance himself is very guilty of this. Um, so I, I don't know about that. I, I do think he is in this moment more committed certainly to um, economic populism, which we talked a lot about in our other segment. We didn't get into, into his foreign policy as much, which is, uh, not down the line, certainly non-interventionist, but he does have, uh, he, you know, leaning into m more of this idea on the new right, and, and this is kind of the part of the new right, which I do have some sympathy for as a libertarian. I do agree with trying to have a more non-interventionist foreign policy. And, you know, th the idea that we would s slightly revisit our strategy, our thinking with NATO and what's going on with Ukraine is not actually at all terrifying to me and I think is actually a, a good idea. And if he's a voice for doing that, I, I, I don't think it's scary. It's interesting to me that that was the, the scary part of the agenda that was highlighted there. Yeah, you would think, and I, I know MSNBC and CNN definitely spent a lot of time talking about you know, his, his uh, I suppose you could call them traditional views about women. Uh, or they would have been traditional maybe a hundred years ago. Right. They belong <laughs> in the kitchen and should not even be allowed to leave. It's it's a that 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 I think is the is where Vance is most vulnerable, uh, both you know across the board um, because his views on on gender equality are pro are pretty retrograde and you know feed kind of a small segment of the Republican base, but not the entire Republican base. Uh, if they would throw out a Harris Whitmer, two women against these two dudes. What a couple months that would be. Mm. Uh, that would that would just be an, just just going just making it just making it all about that and about abortion rights and that would be interesting to see. And, and it's not an argument. I think they would win. Now they might still win because just the winds the way the winds are blowing now. But yeah, that it, it says something about today's Democratic Party that. They would be so much more comfortable with a Nikki Haley than a J.D. Vance. Oh, yeah. Like, They're this close to making her a contributor on one of their networks. Has yeah, she ever absolutely. stopped being a, a voice in the Republican Party? Yeah, Nikki Haley, like Boeing board member, yeah. pro, as pro-corporate, right-wing Republican, right-wing Reaganite, with like the most hawkish, the most hawkish foreign policy views that you can find. Yes. And she speaks in complete sentences and is like charming in person. And so Democrats are like, yes, like this is our person. Because they don't care about the foreign policy. I mean, this is the, the criticism they, don't, they get they, from they don't the care. left and yeah. libertarians and everybody is that that foreign policy is just an, it's either, either an afterthought or they're reflecting the bipartisan hawkish consensus of a previous yeah. generation that they agree with. Yeah, that's what he's saying, that Ukraine is going to get, what, betrayed because, what, we're, we're not willing to fund their defense until, th the failing defense until the entire country is conquered by Russia. We're gonna stop short of that and press for a, a diplomatic resolution that probably does involve Ukraine, unfortunately, losing some territory, but that would be better than, than the thousands and thousands and thousands dying without any potential resolution, without any right. way for Ukraine to actually win. You know, Russia invaded them, totally wrong thing to do, very bad, not good, but 
we had to live in reality. And the reality is, is we either go on and on until more and more of the country is destroyed or until you know, someone makes some difficult choices. And the idea that that's the unthinkable, that's right. the beyond, yeah. or, or, like, no. <laughs> right, and, and now there's some reporting that Zelensky's open to attending this peace summit that that's great. being organized. Yeah. Good. Uh, because he sees the pressure that now they're in such a weakened state, both politically and militarily, that you know, you're definitely not going to get the same deal from Putin that you would have in, say, like March 2022 when there, when there was one on the table that got scuttled by the U.S. And his own advisors and U.S. advisors have been assessing this, you know, we're supposed to listen to the experts, have been assessing the realities for Ukraine and determining that it is just vanishingly unlikely that they can defeat Russia or eject Russia from the country. That has been the case for months now, months and months and months, if not longer. So the idea that you'd be considered crazy for, again, for listening to that and saying, well, then I should, I should base some diplomacy on that. But no, you're, unless, yeah. you ha and you, unless you take the Biden administration's view and the view of many Republicans. So it's, this is you know, an open question in the Republican Party, which yeah. way the Trump presidency would go on this. So I, th I think this is one area. And again, I was very critical of Vance in the other segment we did. There's a lot about Vance I don't like. He was like my least favorite of the potential VP choices. Um, honestly, he was like dead last. One way in which I think he is an improvement, although others might have been even more of an improvement, would be on the foreign policy. Yeah, and, and if people need help thinking it through, your audience is probably pretty much most of the way there already. But think about the fact that in 2023, when you know, uh, Ukraine had you know, tens of thousands of, of more men and women that were still alive, you know, had enormous amounts of ammunition and material that had yet to be uh, destroyed, had the, the v vast amounts of support logistically and intelligence-wise from the United States, and launched this like massive counteroffensive, and it completely failed. And so, if it couldn't work then, how now, after the Russian military has gotten better trained, better equipped, they're producing enormous amounts of material in Russia and constantly and sending it to the front lines. The conscripts aren't in the front lines. Those are, you know, it's a volunteer army. They've they've got conscripts, but they're not the ones that are in the front lines doing the fighting. Uh, why would you think that down the road, with, with fewer Ukrainians, older Ukrainians, yes, that's an important part ones of who don't want to fight, who are conscripted to the front lines, yes. and less weapons, because we you shot them all off. The age why range you, for the Ukrainian conscription right. has, got, has had to get way, way more out of bounds in terms of the and most With a, with a week or people. two of training, just getting just forced at gunpoint to go, to, to go then um, launch these charters. Like why, and, and in a, against an enemy that's now been fortified for that much more time. If your last counteroffensive failed, how on earth have conditions gotten anything than much worse for you? Like, it, it's over, they've got to reach a deal. Yeah, it, it's why, that's, that's reality, that's realism, but you're, the, the pro-intervention crowd always- you, know, you can't like, reward Putin. Right what, there, well, this is in kindergarten, I don't know. <laughs> right, we don't want to, it's I not great. I don't want to either, bad, yes. We gotta live in the real world, and, yeah. the real, and we're not gonna send, there is not public appetite to actually have World War III over this, to actually send American ground forces, no one supports that. Yeah. I mean, the American people are way more inclined toward non-interventionism, America first, whatever you want to call it, than the elite policymakers. They're always like that. It, you can tell it in public opinion polling. It comes through before it hits the people in charge that, oh, actually, there isn't enough public support for this. And they, they learn that time and time again, that both the Republican parties had to learn that and the Democratic parties had to learn it, that their, their wars are just not as popular as the leaders think they are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, that has been another successful installment of Free Media. Tell us a little bit about Dropsite News before we go. Yeah, so dropsitenews.com, uh, Jeremy Scahill and I, uh, last week basically, we left The Intercept joined by uh, former uh, ed deputy editor over at The Intercept, Nausicaa Renner. And we're basically building a, a new Intercept. The Intercept is gonna keep going on. We wish The Intercept well, uh, but, we're, but we feel like we needed to build an independent uh, investigative news outlet that is not gonna be like cranking out content all day long, but when, but when we publish, it's gonna be, these are gonna be big swings going after 
going after powerful people. And I think that, uh, I think a libertarian audience, I think the Reason audience, which I've written for Reason before, they, they excerpted a piece of my book too, um, back, way back in the day. Uh, I think the Reason audience would, would enjoy the kind of reporting that we're gonna do. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, coverage of American imperialism and America's role overseas that, that uh, news, like not analysis. And then a lot, and we're gonna break news about politics here in the United States. Yeah, what well, we learned when we were, the period we co-hosted Rising together for about a year, that we have a lot in common, particularly on mm -hmm. foreign policy, that the left and libertarians, which is not, nothing new, yeah. but um, that there's a lot of uh, overlap and uh, interest. So we'll definitely check that out. Viewers should check that out. More free media next week. Thanks for joining. Like, share, and subscribe. Hit that button below. See you next week.